Greetings, greetings everybody. And welcome to this discussion on mental health, gun violence, and America's distinct problem. I'm Marcia Eli, class of 80 and co-chair of the Pembroke, Pembroke Center Advisory Council Program Committee. On behalf of the Pembroke Center for Teaching and Research on Women, along with my committee co-chair, Ryan Grubbs, class of 10, and with thanks to our co-sponsors, the Brown Women's Network and the School of Public Health, I am honored to welcome you to this commencement forum. A, a brief word about the Pembroke Center. The, the center's name memorializes the Women's College in Brown University, Pembroke College, which ceased to exist as a separate entity in 1971 when it combined with the Men's College. The Pembroke Center was founded in 1981 and has for these 42 years stewarded research, teaching, collections, and programming that explore social change and how questions of difference, difference in gender, sexuality, race, class, religion, and more, affect our thinking and our world. Um, I hope you'll become more familiar with the work of the Pembroke Center by joining our email list and becoming part of our growing community of alumni, parents, students, and community members. Um, Karen Agave in the back, who's waving, um, can tell you all you want to know about how to join the, the email list and, and find out more about our work. This afternoon, we are absolutely thrilled to welcome Dr. Megan Ranney in a conversation about this profoundly timely and troubling topic. It's my honor to tell you a little bit more about her and her conversation partner, Sama Sagari. <laughs> Dr. Megan Ranney is a practicing emergency physician, researcher, and national advocate for innovative approaches to public health. She is currently the deputy dean at the Brown University School of Public Health, the Warren Alpert Endowed Professor of Emergency Medicine at Alpert Medical School at Brown University, and the founding director of the Brown Lifespan Center for Digital Health. This July, she will become dean of the Yale School of Public Health, where she will also be a professor of health policy and management uh, and emergency medicine. Dr. Ranney's research focuses on developing, testing, and disseminating digital health interventions to prevent violence and related behavioral health problems, as well as on COVID-related risk reduction. She has had continuous external funding from federal and foundation grants for more than a decade. She has held multiple national leadership roles and she has received numerous awards for technology, technology innovation, public health and research, including Rhode Island Women of the Year and the American College of Emergency Physicians Policy Pioneer Award. She is an elected member of the National Academy of Medicine. Sema Scare, who will lead this conversation, is CEO and co-founder of Sergo Health, a healthcare technology company developing a revolutionary socio-behavioral analytic platform and generating novel real-world data designed to inform and improve health equity and outcomes by enabling a greater understanding of the complex factors that influence how individuals engage in their healthcare. Sema is a serial healthcare <laughs> entrepreneur she co-founded and led Sergo Foundation and Sergo Ventures. She was initiative lead at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation where she brought innovate, innovations in data, consumer insights, and product introduction into large scale health programs globally. She has published extensively, extensively and is a frequent op-ed contributor to the New York Times, an adjunct and uh, assistant professor at the University of Washington, she completed her fellowship in genomics at Harvard University, PhD in neuroscience from New York University, and MA in neuroscience from Brown. She is a member of the Board of Doctors of the United States of Care and was selected as a rising talent by the Women's Forum for Economy and Society. Please help us welcome our guests today. Thank you so much. Can you all hear me? Excellent. Well, good afternoon, and thank you for coming here today for this 
very important topic. It's such an honor for me to be here today as a Brown alum, uh, to be with my dear, dear friend and colleague, Megan Ranney. Megan and I met during the pandemic or just before the pandemic, and we've had a relationship over Zoom, <laughs> which was very, very productive, and we finally get to meet in person today on stage, which is such an honor for us. <laughs> um, so Megan, thank you for making time. Welcome. It's such a great uh, day to be with you here today. I'm really, really excited about this conversation. Thank you. Um, so we'll, we'll do a Q&A and then I'd love to open it up for your questions because we love hearing from you. Um, but I want to get us started because we're at the Pembroke Center and I think it's only fair to ask this question. Um, I believe behind every strong woman and you're an incredibly accomplished Morgan, Megan. It's, you know, from being an emergency doctor to founding organizations to being a Twitter influencer. I don't know if you guys have seen <laughs> Megan's Twitter uh, um, platform. It's, it's incredible. Um, so behind every strong woman, there's another strong woman. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'd love to ask you, who are some women or a woman that has really been influential in your life? <laughs> That's a great question. So there are so many. That's almost an impossible question to answer. Um, but I think I will call out two. Um, the first is actually Chris Paxson, our president of Brown University. Um, she came here when I was a relatively junior professor and has served as an extraordinary role model to me of what great academic leadership looks like, how you merge values and metrics, um, how you create an institute of higher education that actually walks the walk, and how you maintain a deep attention to humans and to humanity while you're also institution building. So Chris has just been an incredible role model and mentor to me. Um, the other person that I think I will actually mention is my fourth grade teacher. Uh, her name was Dr. Vanderwerf. Uh, she was honestly the first person um, outside of my parents, who I love dearly but who don't really count uh, in this way. Um, she, was, she was the first person to kind of tell me that I could go further, that my thinking that the world could transform was not just you know, the pipe dream of a little girl who was reading an awful lot of Anne of Green Gables and Louisa May Alcott, but was something that was actually achievable. Um, she had a PhD and chose to go back into teaching um, because she saw the potential of young lives, and she absolutely fulfilled that as a teacher. It is something that I try to bring with me in my relationships with my students um, and that I'm forever grateful for. That's great. Well, clearly you've so, come far. <laughs> yeah. They've been really influential. Um, so let's talk about the topic of today, which is really firearm violence mm -hmm. and mental health, which are two issues that are, that are really... Um, I think troubling all of us. Um, and so one thing I want to start with, Megan, is maybe tell us your personal story. What got you interested and passionate in this topic? So I have been working in one way or another in the field of violence prevention. Actually, since I was an undergrad myself, I was president of our Radcliffe Union of Students, so the Pembroke Center equivalent um, as an undergrad, and did a lot of work around sexual assault and gender-based violence, largely because of personal experiences myself and my friend group. Um, I then did Peace Corps and worked on issues of gender-based violence in West Africa. I was in Cote d'Ivoire. It's one of the major sources of transmission of HIV in the late 90s at a time when antiretrovirals were not accessible to folks outside of the United States. Um, and came back to the US to go to medical school, planning to continue to work on issues of gender-based violence and the intersection with infectious disease. And in going into emergency medicine, um, and I'll say that it was actually the care of patients in the emergency department that made me shift from thinking about violence in general to thinking specifically about firearm violence. Um, as an emergency physician, taking care of penetrating trauma, um, gunshot wounds and shoot stabbings is part of the daily routine of our job. Many emergency medicine residents actually choose their residency program to ensure that they get adequate exposure to an adequate number of sh shooting and stabbing patients because it's such a, a core skill for us. And I just accepted this for quite a while. Um, and then the cases started to accumulate. Uh, a domestic violence victim who was shot and killed by her ex-partner, uh, a young man who I had saved once and then couldn't save after a second shooting. And then the case that really started to shift my trajectory uh, was a young man I took care of who uh, had shot and killed himself with his father's um, firearm. It was the first firearm suicide that I had ever seen and there were a number of things about that case that really shifted my approach to this. Um, this was back in kind of the early, first decade of the 2000s at a point when 
No one talked about firearm injury as a public health problem. No one talked about the upstream drivers, the impact of structural racism, economic inequity, unsafe storage of firearms. Um, and so it was, it was a long road. But, but that case really just mm -hmm. um, said to me, I, I couldn't not pay attention to firearm violence itself mm -hmm. um, as opposed to violence in general. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And actually, when you look at the numbers, when you look at the data, there's some really counterintuitive stuff mm -hmm. in that data. Um, which I don't know that many people are aware. Can you talk a bit about what are we learning about who's being impacted the most and who's you know, using firearms the most and who's dying the most? Absolutely, so as a public health professional, I always start with the data and the facts. I think many of you are probably in this room because we are all deeply afraid of firearm injury in this country right now. I will be honest, in the prior seminar, we just had our School of Public Health commencement seminar, there was someone knocking on that door very loudly and my instinctual response, and I actually interrupted the speakers to say, don't open the door, mm -hmm. right? Because where we all go when we hear someone pounding on a door is like, is this a mass shooter mm -hmm. coming to enter? And so that's why many of us are here, right? Is because we are afraid of those horrific random events that should never, ever happen. But the reality is those are only about one or 2%, depending on how you count it, um, of gun deaths in this country. On average, over the last decade, Two-thirds of gun deaths every year are firearm suicides. Chances are that most of us in this room know someone uh, who has taken their life with a gun. And about a third to 30 to 40 percent are firearm homicides. Those disproportionately affect young black and brown men. Um, young black men are at about 20 times the risk of dying of firearm homicide compared to young white men. A couple of other really important statistics. Um, firearm are the leading cause of death for children in the United States and have been since late 2019, early 2020. That is not primarily school shootings. That is primarily homicide with firearm suicide coming in second. Most of those are with a friend or family member's gun. Uh, and then for women, firearm homicide is the leading cause of, women, leading cause of death, um, or leading, excuse me, leading cause of homicide for women. Uh, and that's mostly intimate partner homicide. So I think those stats are important to start with because then they give us a framework through which we can start to talk about accurate prevention. Actually, one more stat that I think most of us don't know, which is that it's actually rural counties that have the highest rates of firearm death in this country, not urban locations. Um, and that, again, is largely because of firearm suicide, but there's also huge firearm homicide rates, um, particularly in uh, impoverished uh, mm -hmm. communities, mm -hmm. impoverished rural communities. Yeah. When I, when I saw that data, to be honest, it was, some of it was really new to me, so mm -hmm. it was um, quite astonishing. Um, I want to come to um, firearm injury death as well as mental health, mm -hmm. the connection between. You said something on a, TED, on a TED Talk, actually, that was here in Providence, which I hope you don't mind. I'm going to quote. <laughs> so you said, two-thirds of deaths caused by firearms are suicides, as you mentioned. Although, ment although mental health is a part of suicide, mental health plays a minuscule role in this epidemic. Can you elaborate a bit on that? Absolutely. So I think all of us, when we look at these shootings, where we go to is, oh my God, those people must be crazy. This is mental illness. I fight back against that assumption for two big reasons. The first is there are behavioral health disorders that play a part in firearm injury. Antisocial personality disorder, substance use, um, one third of homicides, uh, are, uh, alcohol is involved with one-third of homicides. One of the biggest predictors of shooting someone is a prior DUI conviction. Um, but, label, but it's not depression or anxiety or schizophrenia per se that is the risk factor for firearm injury. The second part of why I protest that association is because of the tremendous stigma that already exists against people living with mental illness as an emergency physician, I see on every shift the lack of access to quality mental health care in this country, the stigmatization, the rate of homelessness, um, violence against people with mental illness. And I don't want to give our country another reason to disempower and stigmatize those who are already struggling and underserved. Do we need to talk about the intersection between depression and hopelessness and firearm suicide? Absolutely. This is not to say that talking about mental health doesn't matter, but we need to talk about hatred, 
We need to talk about impulsivity. We need to talk about hopelessness. To simply say, oh, it's a mental health problem, that's like a hand-washing response that does a disservice to those who are already struggling and doesn't actually advance our, our efforts to prevent this problem. Mm -hmm. So while both of them are happening together and maybe related in some form or the other, For sure. they're not necessarily, one is not necessarily causing the other. That, that's primarily. right. And, and, and I'll say, Sema, you know, many of us have heard about the idea of deaths of despair, mm -hmm. which our country is absolutely seeing an epidemic of, or a syndemic, opioid overdose deaths, alcohol misuse, um, alcohol use disorders, suicide, firearm death, those are all deaths of despair. We can talk about despair as an existential problem without blaming it on mental illness. Yeah. And you mentioned the mass shooter, the mass shootings are not necessarily the biggest um, you know, causes of death. However, when we, when we, or at least many of us think of the mass shooter, we think of, oh, this must be someone who's suffering from a lot of mental illness, you know, really at the edge. Um, but there are other, other factors that are showing up of why people are engaging some of this very destructive behavior. Can you say a bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. So, the, so absolutely, you know, the people, when you kind of go back and do a psychological autopsy, as we call it, on folks that have committed these horrific events, um, there is often psychological instability somewhere in their past history. But there are a lot of us in the United States that have psychological instability. That alone is not the thing that derives the mass shooting. Um, you can almost always find signs of a personal crisis, often around an intimate partner or around a workplace um, in the weeks prior to a mass shooting. Increasingly, there is um, a, an affiliation and a following of a lot of hate groups online, um, which serves as a marker. And then, of course, there's the easy access to a firearm um, at the moment when someone decides to uh, inflict harm on others. Mm -hmm. We're going to get back to the solutions uh, yeah. in a moment because I think that's a really important part of this. But I want to also talk about some of the the conversations that are going on in the media and, and what are the narratives. Mm. Uh, and I'd love you to de uh, deconstruct these. So you know, in the democratic leaning media, we see we see a lot of um, you know talk about the psychological toll of you know these firearm um, shootings and deaths. In the Republican leaning media, we see a lot of focus on mental health as the underlying issue. And so moving it away from a, from a criminal issue into a, or, you know, a gun issue into a mental health issue. Mm -hmm. Do you think any of these are beneficial? Do you think any of these are doing a service? Is there another narrative that we should be focusing on? Help us talk through this a bit. <laughs> so I think that media creates narratives in order to create clicks, right? And I've been part of the media establishment for better or for worse over the past few years both around firearm injury and around COVID, I think there is tremendous benefit to working with the media. And I think there are a lot of journalists that are telling really important stories and doing really important deep dives into both the untold causes and the untold consequences mm -hmm. of firearm injury. And I don't, again, want to downplay that psychological toll, um, nor do I want to downplay the importance of prevention. But where I would love to see our narrative shift to is to a public health narrative where we think about this as a health problem with public health solutions, where this is not about giving everyone a firearm. This is also not about taking everyone's firearms away. Let's be honest, those of us in this room that did not grow up either on the East Coast or on the West Coast know that 40% of Americans have a firearm in the household. That is a fact. The vast, vast, vast majority of those firearms and firearm owners never hurt another person or themselves. And if we are going to make progress on this, we need to talk about firearm injury in the same way that we talk about other health problems, which is from a lens of harm reduction, where we start with facts, we identify risk and protective factors, and then we develop and test interventions and put them in play. Just as with car crashes, with HIV, with COVID, the subject of our last um, discussion in this very room, when we demonize people on one side of the aisle or other, we are bound to stop making progress. Instead, we need to find solutions that can work to reduce the risk of harm. Sometimes that will be legislative, but it's a lot of other things too, which may sometimes not be at all about the firearm. And that's where I do think that the the narrative that we'll hear kind of more in the right wing media is not wrong. We do need community investment. We need, do need to take care of those who are suffering. Um, it's a both and. Mm -hmm. and. And it gives us a different kind of way of approaching the problem and then gives us a, a different way of measuring outcomes. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, so you mentioned the public health approach, which obviously is, is what you're advocating. Near and dear to my heart, yes. <laughs> Near and dear to all of us, um, which, which makes a lot of sense. Um, this, this movement started a long time ago. It's not a, a new movement, right? Looking at this issue from a public health perspective. That's right. But we also know certain things happened, certain amendments were put in place that actually kind of crushed the approach yeah. a bit. Could you talk about some of those amendments and, and laws and regulations? Sure. So, so when I started um, as an emergency physician, working in very early days on violence prevention, um, it was soon after a fellow emergency physician, a man named Art Kellerman, who was at Emory at the time, had published a paper showing that people with, firearm in the with a firearm in the home are more likely to die of firearm injury than people who don't have a firearm in the home. This is an incontrovertible fact, but it's not super deep, right? If you have a pool at your house, it's more likely that someone's going to die of a drowning. If you live in a community with cars, if you yourself have a car, it's more likely that you're gonna be hurt in a car crash. That's not a comment about the, it's not a moral judgment on the object, it's just a fact, and then it leads us towards, well then how do we prevent it? Okay, you put up a four-sided fence around pools. You have cars, you change the design of cars, you have a three-point seatbelt, you make sure there are drunk driving laws, we have licensing, et cetera. Instead of taking that paper and saying, what do we do to prevent it, that paper got turned into, in, through certain political advocacy groups, um, in, oh, this is anti-gun. Doctors are anti-gun. And they got a junior representative from Arkansas back in 1996, a, a junior representative from Arkansas named Jay Dickey, um, passed the now infamous Dickey Amendment, which did not actually defund or ban funding of firearm injury prevention within the federal government, but said the CDC may not um, advocate or promote for gun control. Now, the CDC can't advocate for any legislation anyhow, but when that amendment was passed, Congress pulled all the money away from CDC that it had been spending on firearm injury prevention programming and research it was soon thereafter applied to um, uh, the NIH as well. Art Kellerman and others who had been part of this work in the late 90s basically lost their federal funding. And the effect was that it basically chilled the field. So when I was starting as an emergency medicine resident, when I was starting to ask those questions about why are people coming through my door with firearm injuries, what can I do about it? What I was told by mentors was, don't take this issue on, Megan. There is no funding. It is a career killer. The political advocacy groups are gonna come after you. You are dooming yourself if you talk about this. Go choose something easier. Um, don't touch this with a 10-foot pole. It's the third rail uh, of American healthcare and of American politics. It took us 24 years of slow, persistent organizing, coalition building between physicians, public health experts, nurses, social workers, community members, survivors, law enforcement members, EMTs, and so on, to slowly shift that tide. There was a seminal moment in 2018 with the This Is Our Lane movement, which was possible only because we had done the hard work to already kind of organize those of us who were bothered by the fact that we were just accepting this growing epidemic in the United States. Um, but it wasn't until 2020 that we, although it was after Sandy Hook that we clarified that the Dickey Amendment um, actually didn't prohibit federal funding, it wasn't until 2020 that we finally got Congress to reappropriate funding to both the CDC and the NIH to do this work. And now we're starting to see the body of work around it, the level of evidence, the level of community investment, which of course is the most important part. We're starting to see that um, come back. We're starting to see people enter this field and take this on as an issue. We're starting to see governors and state health departments from both Republican and Democratic states start to talk about this, which is what we really need. And we're most of all seeing community groups finally finding that there's funding available to do the work that they have so deeply cared about. They see members of their community being hurt and killed, and they had no way to take this on as a problem. We're finally starting to see that shift. That's super exciting. It if, is. <laughs> I mean, it's like there's really, really <laughs> negative stats out there. Yeah. But there's also this kind of slow, small steps, you know, drip, drip, drip of change that I deeply believe is going to shift the narrative and shift the patterns of disease, I, I hope. There are some scary things which we could talk about that make me less hopeful. <laughs> but, um, but, but that kind of community level work is, is what's actually going to transform the patterns of injury and death in this country. Because there's still some fundamental questions that need to be answered and some research that needs so to be many. done. So maybe 
Who are some of the exciting researchers that are you're seeing out there or some questions that are being asked that you think are really going to be informative in this, in this agenda? That's a great question. Um, there are a bunch. Um, I have a dear friend, and I know there's someone in the audience from Colorado, So I, and I would have mentioned this woman anyhow, but just to call her out. So I have a dear friend, Emmy Betts, who's a fellow emergency physician at University of Colorado, Denver at Anschutz Medical Center, who's doing really transformative work as partnerships between firearm owners and public health professionals working with the military um, and veterans, uh, as well as with gun owners groups across the state of Colorado uh, around firearm suicide and firearm violence prevention. There's a woman, Gina South, who is a physician and public health professional at Penn, who's doing work around greening vacant lots. So she's basically demonstrated, along with a guy, uh, Charlie Brannis at Columbia, that if you randomize neighborhoods where there are vacant lots, you randomize some of them to get a garden in the vacant lot, and some of them to just let the lot stay vacant. In the neighborhoods surrounding where that garden is put in, you see decreased rates of gun violence, decreased stress, decreased depression, decreased violence overall. I mean, it's just, it has nothing to do with a gun. It's like you're just investing in a community that has been traditionally disinvested in. It's, that's just amazing, amazing work. Um, I have a friend out at University of Washington um, in Seattle who's doing really cool work um, with the epidemio with trying to define the patterns of injury. And then there's some folks down at Yale, where I'm heading in a month, um, who are doing neat work around the in uh, carcer incarceral system mm -hmm. in, in the United States, our kind of mass incarceration, particularly of black and brown men, um, the cycle of violence um, that leads folks to be jailed or put in prison in the first place, and then how to decrease that cycle of violence um, afterwards, much of that is tied into hospital-based violence intervention programs, but it's also about a deep level of community investment, educational opportunity, uh, mental health treatment, um, legal assistance, and so on. Some of these seem like it's such a, a large uplift, but then this green space one, it always shocks me. Yeah. It's just like so easy, right? Like, well, let's all go and plant a let's few plant. green trees and make our neighborhoods greener. When I came to Providence this time, I, I was here in 1999, so that's been a, a long time. And I remember the city then, and, and I was walking around yesterday, and, and I've noticed how the city has changed substantially. Mm -hmm. A lot of green space, beautiful walking, beautiful parks. Do we see anything changing in Providence and Rhode Island when it comes to gun violence and what, what the city is doing? So we had some really great successes that kind of got erased during COVID. Mm -hmm. Um, I sit on the board of the Nonviolence Institute, um, which is an absolutely tremendous, tremendous organization here in Providence, Rhode Island. Uh, it is a community-based organization dedicated to the principles of Gandhi and MLK Jr., the principles of nonviolence and of the beloved community, works um, locally, mostly with youth, but also with adults uh, in some of the most uh, violence-prone neighborhoods um, in this city uh, to try to break the cycle of violence. So they hire people who come from the community, who have escaped the cycle of violence, work um, to, uh, with folks that have been in a fight, with family members, with community members, to try to decrease the risk of retaliation, lead trainings for youth to provide them with opportunities, mentorship, um, kind of a vision of what's possible, uh, teaching them basic life skills, providing barber opportunities. We do drives to provide folders and pencils for kids before they go back to school. And the Nonviolence Institute also collaborates with our local um, police. So Providence, Pawtucket, Central Falls Police are all deeply part of the Nonviolence Institute's organization. We actually have police chiefs that sit on our board. And through that partnership, work with our law enforcement colleagues to decrease that kind of instinctual response to an incident, to decrease the violence that law enforcement inflicts on communities to increase the chance of community-driven policing, which many communities that I work with are deeply calling for, right? Folks are not necessarily calling to defund police. They're calling for a different type of policing. We all deserve to be safe. Um, and, and through that partnership and then some partnership with the hospital system that I work in as well, we really successfully decreased the number of shootings in Providence over the last decade. COVID, when many of our community supports decreased, um, saw a, a dramatic rise in the number of shootings in this city. Um, this year has been better than last, so I'm hopeful that with um, the resurgence of community investment and community mentorship that we're going to continue to see a decrease in gun deaths. Um, but uh, the, the Nonviolence Institute is a really, really great example in this state. 
Um, I'll also call out our governor, Gina, or our, our last governor, <laughs> uh, our prior governor, Gina Raimondo, who uh, will be giving an honorary degree to um, here at Brown. Um, she uh, pulled together um, a gun violence task force a number of years ago. Myself and Jim Manny, who was recently our colonel of state police, co-chaired this task force. And again, it was a great example of bringing together what you might think of as unlikely bedfellows to try to chart a course for how we prevent firearm injury in the state partnership, again, with military, veterans, gun shop owners, public health groups, community organizations, mental health organizations, and so on. So I, I do want to give a shout out to Governor Raimondo as well. Now, now Secretary um, Raimondo. Yes. Secretary Raimondo, yeah. <laughs> Clearly, this is a multi, multi-dimensional, multi-sectoral uh, issue and solution, right? Yeah. Um, you mentioned COVID, which was a, a big change we all mm. went through. Um, societal changes play a role. Do you see any other societal changes that are happening, perhaps not as fast as COVID, maybe more slowly, that we are going through that you think is going to have an impact not only on mental health, but as well as on the firearm violence? Like social media, maybe? Maybe. <laughs> I, I, didn't want to, I didn't want to preempt anything. <laughs> so it's, I, I get... And, and our, if you can talk about our teens. I mean, I have yeah. a teenage daughter. I think you have a, a teens, teenage daughter. Yeah. And I think we always, uh, you know, worry. Um, yeah, you all, I'm sure, have seen this or heard of at least the Surgeon General's um, advisory that came out this week around social media and teens. So there are two things that are absolutely true. One is, is that our teens are experiencing increased rates of depression, anxiety, and loneliness, and that that has been increasing since about 2010, which also PS is when the rate of firearm injury started to increase dramatically, when you talk about deaths of despair. The other thing that's true is that our teens are constantly on social media. 95% um, of teens say that they use social media, and many of them say that they use it almost constantly. As the parent of a 14-year-old girl, I can tell you it is nearly impossible to get her off of Snapchat and TikTok because that is where she socializes. Um, and COVID made it worse because they were not around their friends. And so many of my, I try really hard to be a good parent, but I have a 14 year old and an 11 year old. And during COVID, I of course let them sit on YouTube and Snapchat. I let my little guy get social media far earlier than I would have because that was the way that he socialized um, during, you know, thank God again in Rhode Island, thanks to then Governor Raimondo, we got our kids back physically into school in September of 2020. Um, far sooner than much of the country did, but nonetheless, they weren't going to play dates at each other's house, right? So those two things are true. Social media use has gone up, anxiety and depression have gone up. The Surgeon General's advisory says they caused each other, and there is some evidence for that. So there is certainly evidence that as social media use has gone up, we have lost our ability to connect, to have small talk, to resolve conflicts, we have increased our level of loneliness. Um, but there's also some contrary evidence, um, particularly for marginalized populations, um, women, black and brown academics, um, LGBTQ plus youth, particularly those in rural or conservative areas. There are folks for whom we have formed our community online and for whom social media serves as a lifeline um, I'm sure many of you have seen the It Gets Better um, ad campaign um, for uh, young um, LGBTQ plus youth, telling them it gets better because we have such high rates of suicide um, a young, among young uh, sexual minority um, youth. Um, that was shared through social media, right? And so I don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater, but there's certainly some correlation. I think there is a huge uh, moral imperative for us to do better with social media. Now, I can't force tech companies to do anything, but I will say that I've worked with some of them. Um, I sat on a uh, committee with YouTube um, to create credentialing for credible health messengers so that YouTube can now put a check and then increase in their algorithm um, the amplification of credible health messengers rather than having disinformation and bad information spread. It's really tough to get misinformation off of social media and it goes into kind of shades of censorship. Um, so there are other alternatives that we can use instead. So I think there's some great solutions out there. I won't deny that the rise of social media has perhaps enhanced the rise of these deaths of despair, but again, it's not a one-to-one -one correlation mm -hmm. and I think there's some nuance there. Yeah. 
part of it is misinformation, part of it is our ability to socialize in the way we used to and, and the loneliness epidemic. That's right. What is the solution to the loneliness epidemic? <laughs> <laughs> if I knew that, I would be. <laughs> um, I mean, I think it's things like this. I the solution to the loneliness epidemic is to be together. Um, Carlos Lejnex, who I know is going to be giving the baccalaureate address today, um, he's the outgoing president of the BAA, the class of 2000. Um, he runs uh, Big Brothers Big Sisters for kind of the larger Newark area. It's a great program. It's a great Fantastic. program. Yeah. And organizations like that, Big Brothers Big Sisters, Boys and Girls Clubs, 4-H, which I work with nationally on firearm injury prevention, um, those organizations make a huge difference for our kids. And we all can be part of that, right? We can volunteer to show up at our kids' schools or at a community garden uh, or at a senior center. That to me, and then, and then things like this, parties, reunions, being together in person, not defaulting to Zoom because it's easier, but actually making the effort to go to a book club or to go to a concert or to just sit out at a cafe and have a conversation with our neighbors, um, to put down our phone for a little bit. That to me is how we combat the loneliness epidemic. Yeah. Sometimes we expect some big change to happen from the outside, but I think it's small steps that we can all take. Yeah. Um, so I wanna come back now to the firearm uh, issue and mental health and really focus our last 10 minutes on solutions. What can we do? What can others do? Um, again, there was an interesting statistic which really caught my attention which uh, was a 10% increase in behavioral health workforce only led to a 1.2 decrease in firearm suicide. Yeah. Say a bit more <laughs> about mental health professionals, the, the lack of access, the lack of capacity. How important is that? Um, and what other solutions should we be thinking about? So we absolutely all day long need more capacity for in, in the mental health workforce. Undeniable, our country right now is in the throes of uh, truly an epidemic of despair and loneliness, and we need people to help. Doesn't necessarily need to be psychologists and psychiatrists, it can be community health workers, peer counselors. That is a very, very deep need. We need alternative ways of delivering mental health care because we are not going to be able to meet the workforce needs. Uh, digital health solutions, which you and I have both spent so much time working on, can be part of that for folks who are minimally symptomatic, who are not yet in severe mental illness. We have to think differently about how to provide mental health care. But providing mental health care alone is not going to solve our country's firearm injury epidemic. That stat that you just quoted is one that sticks with me. 10% increase in mental health workforce will only be linked to a 1.2% decrease in suicide. And that's because of guns. And I don't want to say that all of our firearm injury epidemic is about the firearm. Um, I don't want to demonize firearms or firearm owners. However, it, there is an undeniable link. And so there are things that we can do to decrease firearm injury while we also pay attention to mental health that are tremendously effective. Those are things like knowing that we ha if we have a loved one who is depressed or hopeless, struggling with mental illness, um, demented, struggling with substance use disorder, uh, making sure that they don't have access to a loaded firearm can literally save their life. So that might mean taking the firearm out of the house for a short period of time. It might mean locking it up and making sure they don't have access to the key. It might mean removing the ammunition from, from the house. Anything we can do to put time and distance between someone at risk and a loaded firearm saves a life. The second thing is advancing safe storage. I mentioned earlier that most children who take their own life or take another person's life do so with a friend or family member's gun. Safe storage or secure storage is one of the biggest things we can do to protect our kids. When I am talking to parents as a physician, I'll talk to them about kind of how their guns are stored, and they'll say, oh, you know, yeah, I store it loaded and unlocked, but my kid doesn't know where it is. And I'm like, there's actually studies showing that 75% of kids do know where their parents' firearm is, but you may not trust the studies. Tell me, has your child ever found their birthday presents? <laughs> Every one of our kids has found their birthday presents. And, find and more. You, and more, <laughs> yes, and more. <laughs> And maybe you trust your kid, but now tell me, do you trust every one of your kid's friends? 
Because I'll tell you, I don't. <laughs> there are some kids that I'm like, yeah, they're not coming over when I'm not home. <laughs> um, and, and the same is true here. So you may trust your kid, but I, I'm actually going to bring up Kristen Song, who is um, a parent who I've gotten to know. She lives in Connecticut. Her son, Ethan, um, lost his life when he was playing with an unsecured firearm at one of his friend's houses. Uh, they, the, his friend, um, his friend's parent had a gun that was not secured, and they started posting social media posts of themselves posing with a firearm, started mm -hmm. to get a bunch of likes, and kept doing it, and then one day the gun was loaded and he was playing with it, and he accidentally shot himself. And so she has created a movement around Ethan's law, um, promoting safe storage laws across the United States. That's something that every firearm owner can get behind, um, but we have to recognize uh, the reasons for firearm ownership, which is often self-protection, so we have to work on that too. So those are two things, making sure there's time and distance between someone who's kind of in a moment of crisis and a firearm and then making sure our guns are securely stored are two huge things that cross the aisle that we can do to make a difference. There are others too, and I'm happy to talk more about legislation, but I think one of the really big things is that we have to find spaces where we can work together, whether we are part of the 60% of households that don't have a gun or the 40% of households that do. That stat has been true for decades. Um, we, we have to find ways to work together yeah. if we're gonna decrease this epidemic. That story is so, chilling in some ways because even if you don't own a firearm that's right if your family is that your child can have access to someone else that may own and you may not know that that's you, right you don't know um, your friends parents and what they have at home so you mentioned um, so do you find owners to be receptive to this and and, yeah. and how do they balance this you know immediate access for self-protection you know as well as access away from their children. So what's the balance there? How, how do you make that happen? So I, as an emergency physician, I have done, spent my whole career working with people who may make different decisions from my own. Um, that's part and parcel of being a great emergency physician is gaining trust and creating an alliance to improve health. I find it is no different um, in this work. And I will say part of it for me, I, I come, I grew up in Buffalo, New York. I have family members, um, both in my own and my husband's family, who are military, secret service, um, hunters. So firearm ownership is not a foreign concept to me. Um, I don't personally own a firearm because of that statistic about uh, a household with a firearm is more likely to have a firearm death. Um, but I, I don't pass judgment. It's, all right, how do we make your household safer? Mm -hmm. How do we decrease the risk of harm? And, and most of my research is actually with firearm owners, whether it is with young urban men who own a firearm in order to protect themselves, or whether it is with rural white families who also own a firearm in order to protect themselves. You start by respect for the reason that someone chooses to have a firearm in their possession, and then you go from there, which is nobody owns a firearm because they want to hurt themselves or see someone in their family hurt the opposite of the reason that they own it. So let's talk about how do we then decrease the risk of you or your family member getting hurt, because that's ultimately all of our goal. Mm -hmm. This is such a productive way to actually approach this issue rather than demonizing people mm -hmm. who own firearms. Um, the other thing that really struck me was around school drills for mass shootings. Mm. Um, do they work? What effect do they have? Is it something that we should keep doing even if they're not let's say the leading cause of death, but they're still important. Yeah. So I'm gonna look around this room and I'm gonna ask you to raise your hand if you have ever been in a lockdown drill. Wow. Yeah. Uh, and I'm gonna look and I'm gonna comment that most of the people that raised their hand, not all, but most, were probably younger than 40. So this is something that has become part of the lives of our children in the same way that bomb drills were part of my mother's life, right? My mom is a baby boomer, um, and she'll talk about how when she was growing up in the 50s, right, there used to be kind of drills for the threat of nuclear war. Our kids are growing up with the threat of firearm injury. Um, my son had his first uh, shooting lockdown drill um, when he was in preschool. They called it turtle time. They would curl up like turtles under their preschool desks and turn the lights off and we're told to stay very, very quiet. And he would come home and talk about it and it actually became a coping skill for him. So there was a, I found out about this because we had a really loud thunderstorm over our house and he curled up under the table in our living room. And I was like, buddy, what are you doing? <laughs> and he's like, it's turtle time, mom. 
we're told that if we hear loud, scary noises, we should curl up like mm -hmm. a turtle and be quiet. And I was like, oh my God, as a mom, you know, it took, but to him it was just, this was just, it was not terrorizing to him. This was just the way that things were. My daughter who is um, about to enter high school says to me that she always wears sneakers mm -hmm. to events because you never know if you're gonna have to run, mom. Um, and that's not something that traumatizes her. That is just a fact. The same way that I was living in New York City during 9-11, and I don't know how many of us stopped wearing high heels for a bit after 9-11 when we had friends that ran out from ground zero. So I think part of it is in the way that we shape it. Um, I think that preparing people for the worst, you know, talking to folks that have been through these emergency situations, having something in their mind of what they would do can be helpful. And the reality is right now, there are sadly uh, a growing number of mass shootings in the United States. So having been through a non-emotional, this is what you do drill is not the worst thing in the world. Uh, where there is great evidence that we should not be drilling people is these hyper-realistic drills mm -hmm. where you actually pretend mm -hmm. that there is an active shooter. We might do that in the emergency department because we do like prep disaster drills. Mm -hmm. You can do those, and I'll quote Beth Cameron, who's sitting here, who does a lot of global security work. You can do tabletop exercises also. You don't need to actually make people go through that trauma. Um, and so there's no reason to traumatize folks who may have already been traumatized in their life before something actually happens. There are ways to do these that are good at preparing us, but don't kind of worsen um, the already existing fear um, in our society. Yeah, yeah. Um, so we have a few more, one, one more minute left before we open it up to the audience, but I wanted to ask one question, Megan, and then there's so much we can talk about. If there is one thing each of us could do leaving this room on, on this important issue, what is that one thing? More. Can I do two? Of course. Okay. <laughs> so my two are, the first, I, get involved with your community. I mean it, it is the biggest thing that we can do for our human health as well mm -hmm. as for the firearm injury epidemic. It is so natural, especially in this polarized moment, to want to pull back. But the more that we can build bridges, um, the more progress that we will make, not only on this, but on many, many other public health issues, as well as our own mental health. So that's the first. And the second is to remember about secure storage. If you yourself have a firearm, if one of your friends or family members have a firearm, to be able to have that conversation around storing the firearm locked and ideally unloaded is something that absolutely saves a life. Two very practical, implementable solutions yeah. that we could all do. Um, great. So I'd love to open this up to the audience. Um, if you have a question, if you could please come up to the mic. Um, please uh, let us know your name. And Thank you. Ask and I'll answer questions as quick. I promise to not be wordy so we can get through as many as we can. <laughs> Hi. Hi, I'm Barbara. I'm an alum from the med school. And um, I have one thing um, to tell you. A week from today, the national... I mean, the Nonviolence Institute's having a block party yes, we were part in of Providence to organize it. from 10 yeah. to 4 p.m., just so people know. And then, so that's my statement. But my question is, um, when they say this gun, gun violence is mental health, but there's mental health around the world, and that's no right. one has the amount of um, gun violence we have. So how can people in America believe it's mental health? And how can we get rid of the AR rifles? Yeah. How can we... <laughs> So how can we believe, so I mean, I think, again, it's two things are true. We have to address mental health in this country, absolutely, or mental illness, and we have to talk about firearm injury. Two things can coexist and not necessarily be a one-to-one -one correlation. There's some overlap, but not complete. Regarding AR-15s, that is a long mm -hmm. question for a long discussion. I will actually say, so I am, um, uh, yeah. <laughs> Just as we don't have F1 car, you know, Formula One cars on the road with the rest of us, we have regulations about what kind of cars can drive. However, I, that is actually not the thing that will make the greatest difference in firearm injury rates in this country. More than 80% of gun deaths in this country are with a handgun. And so there are a lot of things that we can do that are gonna be tremendously effective in decreasing firearm injury rates in this country, in addition to talking about what types of guns people have access to. So, so I think we don't need to... It's a both and. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. We don't have to solve the mental health issue to be able to solve the firearm injury and death issue. I mean, I think we should be solving both. Both. No, exactly. Yeah. No, I just want to say one yeah. is not necessarily directly. That's it's right. It's not a direct. It's both are happening, and we have to think about both right. um, together. Thank Over you. here. 
Hi, my name is Caleb Schultz and I'm a current student at Brown. Hi. And I'm wondering uh, in like our technology driven society and like the introduction of AI and lots of different data, how can we use these tools to advance gun violence prevention? I love that question. I think we've chatted before, yes? We did. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, I'll look a little bit at Sema here, but I think, um, so there's a lot. So the first is kind of this idea of how do we identify folks that are highest risk mm -hmm. in ways that also preserve privacy and are ethical. Um, there's always a balance, so you don't want to be profiling people, um, but there are ways to identify who's highest risk. And there are some brilliant examples of threat assessment teams, um, use of social media data to identify risk, and then to do something that's kind and proactive about it. Um, there's a group in Chicago called Ready, which is based out of the University of Chicago Crime Lab, that has created a beautiful ML model um, that identifies the folks that are highest risk for being involved with firearm homicide. They then take their model's output and combine it with humans to try to identify who's actually highest risk and deliver interventions. Um, so there, that's one example. Um, another example is around that identification of those really harmful social media posts. Um, I did a study here um, uh, looking at YouTube imagery around firearms and the who is exposed to which YouTube imagery around firearms. There was also just a very recent report out um, looking uh, on a deeper level at what our youth are being exposed to around firearm imagery. That's something that we can use um, advanced data systems to hopefully pull off of public social media forums um, because it's traumatizing and harmful. So thank you for asking. Thank you. It's good to see you, Caleb. <laughs> Hi, my name is Justin. Thank you so much for speaking today. Um, I have two questions, if you don't mind. First is about misinformation and how that might play a role with both mental health and gun violence. I actually see Professor Wilson and Professor Wardle. I was in healthcare in the US this past semester, so I remember that lecture yeah, pretty yeah, well. Yeah. It was one of my favorites. Um, and my second question is about kind of how do you balance, you know, kind of one on one patient interaction and maybe going from the emergency room and flying to Washington, D.C., and then all of a sudden, <laughs> like, advising politician policy. I can't imagine, like, how quickly your head must spin from, like, working on such an intimate patient level and then just Aww. kind of on the broad scales. Kind of curious how you balance that or maybe how the two intersect. It's Superwoman. That's, that's <laughs> <No>. <laughs> um, let me take the second question first, <laughs> just because, uh, I mean, so... God knows, I don't know. I, I have great friends, a great team, a great spouse, which I think is probably one of the most important things you can choose is who your partner is. Um, uh, and I love it. And so I think the biggest thing is, is that it's all driven by the same core desire, which is to make the world a better place. My work in the emergency department feeds my soul in some ways, um, but being able to fly down to DC and chat with the Surgeon General or chat with folks on the Hill also feeds my soul. So it's, to me, I don't see them as kind of in opposition. It's all part of a continuum of trying to create change. Um, and I'll be honest, as I transition to this new role um, down at Yale, I am trying to figure out how much time I spend on these various things, and we'll see. So stay tuned and come back and ask me in a year. <laughs> um, to the first question around misinformation, actually, it's a huge part. Um, and I'll say just as much misinformation, but also access to wrong information or absence of information. Mm -hmm. So when we did that study of YouTube imagery on uh, around firearms, um, what we found was very little information around the actual risks of firearm ownership, particularly suicide. Um, we found very little information about secure storage. Uh, we found very little information about how to recognize risk factors. Um, we find a lot of mythology. And for mental illness as well, we see a lot of stigma and misleading information and a lot of absence of access to high quality care. This goes back to my comment a little earlier around the importance, and I'll go to Caleb's question about digital. It goes to um, and how do we improve access to high quality mental health care and mental health information in this country at this moment where our workforce is absolutely insufficient. I do think that we need to use digital tools to provide better information, to create community and combat that loneliness epidemic, to improve access for folks who are not severely mentally ill, or maybe for those who are, and, and connect them into a group. Um, I could go on for a while, but I won't. So that, that's the kind of the short version of the answer. Hi, I'm Clara Brown. I'm a community mental health 
worker. Yay, um, thank you. <laughs> and social worker. I, I'm actually in Woonsocket, Rhode Island. I'm actually just the child of an alum. Um, I think, so I love your harm reduction approach kind of to this concept of, yes, people live with mental illness. Yes, people have access to guns, which is so true among my clients. Yeah. And um, they have access to opioids too. And, Talk about harm reduction. And they yeah. do, yes. And so I think my biggest question or struggle right now, and, and maybe this is like the homeless population may be too niche to you know, explore in this conversation. Oh. But I mean, safe storage sounds like it is such an important part of the conversation. How, what other approaches would you say that we can use for people who own guns, who struggle with mental illness um, and may not have access to mental health care regularly? It's a great question. So I think that there it's about the environment change. Yeah. So um, I'll look actually at Francesca Bodwin, who sits in the audience, who's a dear friend, um, fellow emergency physician and chair of FE here, um, who works uh, in Woonsocket, in Kodak. Um, I'm calling you out, yeah. <laughs> um, but, but I think about kind of, and, and she and we've had discussions around um, violence prevention for this population, where I think that this is kind of moving from the, we have to move from the individual level to the structural level. Mm -hmm. So we are not gonna tell someone who is not housed doesn't have shoes that fit their feet, doesn't know where their next meal from, and is constantly at risk of being, uh, having someone be violent against them, that like their safe storage of a firearm is the lowest on their list yeah. of priorities, right? So if we go to like Maslow's hierarchy of needs, we got to address those basic structural needs if we're going to get to the other ones. So it's about fine, you know, we in the state deeply need to solve our housing inaccessibility um, and, mm -hmm. and the cost of housing we need to think about how we provide food. And here, I'm gonna move from my like idealistic public health approach to also a, a, a world where I've worked a lot with government and with for-profits. So it's very easy for me to say, all we need to do is provide housing to everyone. <laughs> totally true, but really not practical. So to me, then the question becomes, how do we create partnerships that provide sustainable housing where it's not a one-time grant it's not me standing on my high horse here at Brown um, saying, we have to house everyone. How do we actually create those partnerships to help make it happen? I'm hopeful that Stephen Pryor will do good work for the yes. state. Um, uh, Stefan, excuse me, Pryor will do good work for the state um, in that aspect. But it, it takes true partnerships between the for-profit sector, the not-for-profit sector, academia, healthcare, um, uh, and, and the people that are most affected. Thank you. Sure. We need sustainable solutions, not one time. Yeah, I mean, this this to me is the thing with public health, and this is how do we actually create solutions that we can continue, mm -hmm. that will stay funded outside of applying for a HRSA or a SAMHSA grant. Um, if I look at Ann Zink, um, who's coming to us from Alaska, right? You and I have had so many conversations about braided funding and about finding foundation. You know, you're, yeah. you spent time at Gates. How do we think about using those sources of funding as seeds? For something that then becomes mm -hmm. sustainable, um, rather than depending on largesse yeah. of philanthropy or government. Um, I'd love to believe that that will come, but I, I can't count on it, especially in today's political climate. Hi, thanks for your talk. My name is Martin. I'm a senior this year. Um, I have Congrats. two questions. Thank you. Um, I have two questions for you, if you don't mind. Uh, the first is, you talk about safe storage and um, trying to help gun owners who are responsible prevent uh, gun deaths within the home. but what about the larger problem of people that have illegal guns or guns that are defaced where we don't have a serial totally. number? Totally. Thank you for asking that. And that was actually one of the big things that came out of our task force. Um, the task force that Jim and I ran under Governor Raimondo, we were one of the very early ones in the country to call out the problem of ghost guns, mm -hmm. which is a huge mm -hmm. problem. So for those who are not familiar, ghost guns, basically they can be 3D printed. You order a few mm -hmm. parts off the internet and then you make a totally untraceable firearm. You do not have to go through any background check. It is the scourge of police officers right now across the country. We are seeing rising rates of ghost guns um, in Rhode Island, but also truly across the country. There was an executive order banning them about a year ago from President Biden, um, but it is something, This, when we talk about technology, this is a place that tech companies can play a huge difference, is helping to get those um, blueprints for ghost guns off of the internet. It would be tremendous, and it's one of the things that actually scares me a lot because we can pass every law in the world, and when someone can go and make their own gun at home, doesn't matter what the laws are. The second thing is uh, we are seeing an increasing proportion of firearms used in crimes that are coming from uh, guns that were stolen from vehicles. Um, we're also seeing a decrease in time to crime from when a firearm is um, 
uh, kind of originally sold until the time when it is used in a crime, thought to be largely due to these rings of kind of diversion of, of firearms from licit legal sellers to illicit sellers. It's something that our current um, uh, head of ATF is working a lot on. This is, again, where secure storage makes a difference. Lock your gun up if you have one in your car, because otherwise it's getting stolen, particularly if you've got your NRA sticker on the back that the thieves know to <laughs> go to that car. Um, so so it's, it's a really important question. Thank you for asking it. And then the second question is, uh, I know Switzerland has a very similar uh, rate of yeah. gun ownership to the United States, but they have many fewer mass yeah. shootings. I think the last one was in 2001. Um, can we follow any advice from the Swiss government? I, I'm sure that gun owners in this country uh, would not be opposed to you know, doing some background checks or going to demonstrate that they can shoot. Yeah. Um, so, I'll say, so this is actually a really great point. So actually the vast majority of fi firearm owners in this country, like the vast majority of fire non-firearm owners, are kind of somewhere in this like middle 70 or 80%. You know, when you do surveys, um, most firearm owners support background checks because you don't want the bad guy to have the gun. And yes, there's this thing about, well, criminals are gonna get guns anyways, but well, so then let's make sure they don't. Um, let's actually crack down on dealers who give guns, to, you know, sell them to, to, straw, to straw dealers. Um, my sister, who's a class of 2000 Brown grad, actually is a Swiss citizen now. So I spend a lot of time talking to her about Switzerland. Our rate of firearm ownership is actually quite a, a fair amount higher than Switzerland, but they have um, much stricter policies around licensing and permitting. Um, and they have actually firearm ownership and firearm safety as part of their curriculum. So the decathlon, which is like you cross country ski and then you shoot a rifle, is their Swiss like national sport. Um, <laughs> Only in Switzerland. Uh, so, so there's a different degree of respect mm -hmm. for both the privilege, but also for the potential harm. I'm going to ask my Pembroke colleagues, because I know we're up for time. Do I need to close, or can we take these last questions? Excellent. Thank, Thank you. you so much. And okay. obviously, understand if you need to go to other yes. things. I know this is a jam-packed day. so. Oh, uh, yeah. Doctors, first off, thank you so much for this enlightening conversation. I'll try and be quick so everybody can get their questions. And in. I'll try to be quick, too. I sometimes am challenged. Yeah. So, so I'm Brian. I'm a, a proud uh, graduate student uh, parent. Wonderful. And um, just, uh, just a couple of weeks ago, a friend of mine uh, you know, informed me that uh, you know, he was uh, purchasing a gun, going to Pennsylvania, purchased a gun because it was easier, easier to get there because he felt unsafe and yeah. he felt like the the country's headed in uh, the wrong direction. Yep. Now, um, uh, this is more or less a legal question, but I believe it could influence you know, behavioral change. Now, this same friend uh, you know, loves money, um, financially risk averse, and uh, are gun owners, are they liable for what other people do with their guns? I love this question, thank you. So, in the world of injury prevention, we talk about there being four E's that we use to decrease the chance of injury. The first is economics. And so that's things like for driving, we have safe, we have you know, incentives on our insurance if we're a safe driver, and we also require insurance. And PS, you have fines if you are speeding or whatever. The firearm industry is a little bit different. Um, firearms are actually the only consumer product which is um, exempt from the ability to be sued. Hmm. Uh, and in most states, firearm owners um, cannot be held liable for what happens with their firearm. That's one of the things about those safe storage laws that Kristen Song is passing in Ethan's law, is the idea that firearm owners will be held liable if their firearm is used um, illicitly. In the states where those exist, they're generally not enforced. So there's a whole series of things, but that is a space that many of us are looking at as a, a space that we can um, make a difference. The mayor of San Jose has recently uh, required that firearm owners get insurance. Um, this is a controversial idea that is going to be going to the courts, um, but it is it is a space that I think there is um, potential for, you know, those economic consequences, which make people think a little more carefully yes. about the decisions that they make. But thank you for calling that up because that is we are seeing an increasing number of young black women, LGBTQ plus people buying firearms because we are afraid that if we don't own one, what's gonna happen when the Civil War starts. And so thank you for calling that out and may your friend please be safe. Talk to him about safe storage. I, I will. <laughs> I'm Anne, I'm a neighbor. I ask a question over and over again. It's a technology question. Mm -hmm. Everything I use has my fingerprint. Mm. How can we have fingerprints on guns so that only the owner can use that weapon. And nobody has an answer. 
So it exists. Smart, it's a great question. Smart gun technology exists. Um, the companies that make them can't find buyers. And that is a complex political morass that takes longer than a couple of minutes. But it is a technology that exists. It just has not been widely sold or bought. More on that. Yeah. Hi, Michael Warner. Um, on the subject of suicide, I've heard the argument that, well, if someone wants to commit suicide, you take away their guns, they're just going to find another way to do it. Can you talk briefly about how untrue how, that is? <laughs> how, how the high efficiency of using a firearm to commit suicide compared to other things yeah. is, is misjudged or misunderstood and how that factors in where you should focus your harm reduction efforts mm -hmm. given that fact. Thank you. So um, for the sake of time, I will, I, so I'm going to answer it quickly. And then I'm in, I mentioned Emmy Betts, who's the physician in Colorado. Look up her TED Talk, which she gave back in like 2010, 2012, um, around firearm suicide. Um, she started working on this after she lost a family member to firearm suicide. And the whole TED Talk is about exactly this issue. So firearm, or excuse me, suicide attempts with a firearm are 90% likely to be fatal. All other suicide methods combined, 10% likely to be fatal. One of the reasons that that firearm suicide stuck with me back in the kind of mid or early to mid 2000s was because it was the only, um, or it was one of only a couple of suicide attempts that I had ever been unable to save in the emergency department. The reality is most die in the field and don't ever make it to my door. If you can save someone's life after a first suicide attempt, they almost never go on to die by suicide. If you can get someone through that initial period of hopelessness and impulsivity and get them into treatment, they almost always go on to live a full productive life and die of natural causes. So that access to a firearm in that moment of impulsivity and hopelessness has a tremendous impact on whether someone lives or dies. So thank you. you for asking. Uh, hi, I'm Diego. Um, nice to meet you. Try to make this quick. Uh, mm -hmm. So my question is, what role would you say that social atomization plays on producing uh, a mass shooter? Yeah. And what are things that communities can do communally to reduce that social atomization? A brilliant question that we don't have full answers to yet. Um, I, I'm going to be honest. So we all hypothesize that it's part of it. Um, there's not great data yet. There are a couple of terrific people, Jillian Peterson, um, Jennifer Carlson, who's recently named a MacArthur Genius Fellow, she's out in Arizona, who are looking at precisely this question, mm -hmm. but we don't have great answers. What can we do? Again, it to me comes down to these community get-togethers, reaching out to people, um, creating bridges, creating human live communities as well as online communities. Um, there's no way that that atomization is not harmful mm -hmm. to the human psyche. And our last question, thank you, I just snuck in here. Um, just another question about safe storage, I'm a grandparent, mm. and I wonder, do you ever communicate with pediatricians yes. about maybe raising that question you know, to parents when they come in? Do you have a gun? Where do you store it? Because I know my daughter would feel awkward saying to every uh, parent of her children's playmates, oh, <laughs> what yeah. is your, you know, what do you do about guns in your house? So it's actually where much of this, <clears throat> so much of my early work was around um, screening and brief interventions by healthcare providers. Unfortunately, most healthcare providers have not been trained in how to ask nor how to counsel. Um, there, we recently did a survey with the Kaiser Family Foundation. Only 14% of parents report ever having been asked about whether or not they have a firearm in the home. This is a huge space that we're working on across the country. I will say that if you are a grandparent or a parent, if you Google um, the Ad Council, mm -hmm. um, they did this, it's not safe for kind of video, um, they have some very amusing imagery, to me it was uh, around the things that kids find. Mm -hmm. And it's a great kind of somewhat lighthearted video to show families um, who insist that they're, they don't um, need to ask. There's also a great video that Northwell Health just put out around um, uh, asking when kids go to a play date. So I would say to Google those as, as exemplars. But the work with pediatricians is a big part yeah, that I a bunch of us are working on. Pediatricians could introduce yep. that topic. Totally. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. This has been a fantastic session. Uh, Megan, thank you so much. Thank you. Wonderful. Um, I love the questions from the audience. We always love hearing from you. And Megan, thank you for making time. More to come on this topic. Thank um, you. But thank you. Thank
Thank you all. Thank you all for being here and for caring. So here's to change. Thank you for coming. Gemma, thank you.